My name is Sulek Dreyfus. Thank you very much for um, the introductory, introductory talk this morning. Uh, you'll hear my voice is slightly fading because I'm suffering from the virus of Melbourne winter cold, so I apologize for that in advance. But uh, thank you very much to Scott and also to Andrew for his very interesting talk. Um, I think you'll find it interesting that Andrew and I will have uh, a difference of view on a number of these issues. Uh, I would say an equally interesting survey to run, based on Andrew's hands up survey, straw survey, is how many of you kept your eyes closed? Can you put your hands up? <laughs> how many of you started with your eyes closed and then kept them closed the entire way? Okay, so that would be a very small number relative to the number of people in the room. I think maybe, what, a quarter or so, we'd say? For me, that is as or more telling than the survey that Andrew has run, because that says that something like three quarters of the people in the room want to know. <laughs> they want the information. They are interested in the information, even if the information is supposed to be confidential in order to protect people's identities and views on things. <coughs> so I'm going to see if I can work this flicker. Let's see if we can do. Yes, OK. I want to present um, two possible worlds to you at the top, top of this discussion. The first world is a vision, oh, vision number one, um, which is the internet as an open international platform for citizen engagement. Um, it's a public good, a library, an educator, a communication system. It's about the Khan Academy letting kids from poor backgrounds learn how to code for free. Um, it's a precious archive of human knowledge and endeavor. That internet governance is open, transparent, distributed, committed to universal access and reliability. That the citizenry are engaged and networked and informed and alert. And the internet is an expression of Aristotelian democratic ideals of freedom of expression and, and virtual um, uh, freedom of assembly. And that there is some elements at the fringe of this vision that are also, I'm sure, as Andrew would say, um, uh, anarchic, libertarian, and perhaps a bit utopian. <coughs> and that information wants to be and is, in fact, free. That's vision number one. And it's kind of a vision of hope. Um, remember hope. Um, there's a Woody Allen joke that goes, you know, I feel so much better now that I've given up hope. Um, and then there's another possible path, and that's vision two. And vision two is a digital world where we evolve to mirror an information system. And I can say this, I can be critical of information systems because I work in the information systems area. <clears throat> That's where you have economic and democratic agencies morphing into agencies of data management. Corporations and governments assert eminent domain over their data, all their data. Rules will define access and usage privileges and restrictions. Data and information security match military grade imperatives. All information is classified, top secret, secret, or in some cases unclassified. All users are categorized, authorized, guessed, or access denied. The security objectives dominate all other objectives, the objectives of openness and access. <clears throat> and this vision is one that is built on objectives of control. Those are the two possible visions that we could, in a sense, go forward towards. And it may well be that we end up that somewhere in between, but I hope it is much more aligned with uh, that the first vision, which I think of as the, the goo goo vision, so that's sort of um, a term that was used for the good government people uh, under Franklin Roosevelt, the goo goos. I think of this second vision as being much more about sort of corporate and government control, so the, um, you could call them the co con vision. But hopefully, we will not be down the second path. I hope we'll be down the first path. Um, a fundamental element that I think is important when you think about FOI, if you go back to fundamentals, is that in every community there's a necessary balance between the rights of citizen and the powers of the state. And this balance has many tools that affect it. One of those tools, one of those levers is FOI, and it's a critical tool in making sure that this balance is kept just right 
particularly for the individual citizen, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So to the question of FOI, is there too much information, I just want to touch on digital disruption. There's a book that's just come out in the past month or so um, by McKinsey & Co. that reminds us we're at this dawn of what they call no ordinary disruption. And they go through genomics and a whole set of robotics of things that are causing digital disruptions and show that we are in a state of flux. That's important because it means we need to really think hard, doubly hard, about the tools we're going to be using in the future to keep this balance of power between the state and the citizen, not just for today, but also for tomorrow in the face of this disruption. So the paradox, in a sense, of the digital revolution is that there's a risk of more data and information, but less democracy. More widely spread surveillance and restricted information and, uh, and the criminalization of informational activism, as it's called, whether that's whistleblowing, a right to dissent, journalism, publication of sensitive material, freedom of the press. So those are very, you know, that's a very real risk. Some of the um, uh, reasons why FOI, I think, will be important today, but even more vital for tomorrow, uh, is that we have a set of forces descending on us from this era of disruption. And they are coming from technology and large-scale information, and they are changing our landscape. <coughs> so think about FOI in that context. So I say we're not in the 1980s anymore, Dorothy, because I was thinking about a, I, I heard um, the former premier of the state, John Cain, speak um, about when he first was bringing in the FOI laws about 30 years or so ago here in Victoria, how he had run into um, one of the senior judges on the steps of Parliament House as he was um, introducing it uh, and the judge had said to him, this is a very bad idea, Premier. This is it. The Westminster system has everything that it needs for people to know what's going on. You don't need FOI. And uh, John Cain had disagreed with him. He had obviously um, pushed ahead with the FOI legislation. He still felt that some things were sacrosanct. He referred to um, cabinet as the oyster of cabinet, which I think is a lovely terminology to describe the importance of being able to uh, close and secure the private conversations that occur in cabinet. But he also understood with the finely um, tuned antenna of a, of a very skilled politician, the importance of people being able to get information about themselves from government. And he said, yes, and we let people be able to search themselves through FOI. And they love that, he said. <laughs> they love that. Um, the things that are changing on our horizon, uh, the explosion of big data, which makes government very powerful in the relationship with the citizen, the rise of robots, and I use that term sort of broadly, but what I mean by it is that <coughs> increasingly we are using and we will use much more automation, automating functions to manage that and, and troll that big data. So that's pattern seeking and matching. But these tools have some quite serious flaws and I'll talk about an example of that in just a minute. Um, uh, there are new legal threats on freedom of speech and journalism. So you may have seen the um, debate around the special operations clause of recent uh, national security legislation which potentially criminalizes the reporting of this if you're a journalist for up to 10 years. The rise of the security surveillance and secrecy start, uh, state where more data is kept on citizens and more of it is behind a veil of secrecy and there are more security clearances. Information asymmetry between the citizen and the state and that's a growing issue. And there's also tool asymmetry. So even if citizens had the same amount of information, they wouldn't have the same tools or powerful tools to be able to access and analyze that information that government has. So the asymmetry is doubled. And the overall impact of this is actually, I would say, a lessening of the power of the individual in its relationship with the state in that balance that I spoke about earlier. <coughs> to give some perspective to this, um, uh, governments now have data centers that store hundreds or thousands of terabytes of data covering things about the citizenry. Um, topics being cover covered are cradle to grave. Um, so for example, there was a contract led about a year and a half ago in Victoria <coughs> um, at the education ministry that was really um, uh, tracking all sorts of 
single user information from maternal and child health care through the education system all the way up. Um, and that was um, given preference to a foreign vendor. Um, and when the minister w at the time was asked um, uh, what uh, security and privacy restrictions were on that, the reporter asking him uh, was told, well, that would be determined by the winning vendor, which was a little alarming. Um, but uh, we see essentially it's kind of an Australia card without the card, all of this information. So there's some details. I'll, I'll just pull out a couple of stats so you get a, a, a metric. Five million Australian facial recognition images, which are now not just shared within the Australian government, but with foreign governments, so with the US government through the Freedom Centre in Maryland. Um, and international travel details for Australians are shared internationally. So you now got not only a large collection of data, but also a large collection of data that's being shared with other governments as well. You've got telephone metadata. Um, so in Victorian, just Victoria agencies, the um, access authorizations over the past four years would be greater than a quarter of a million. You've got security clearance creep across the whole of government. Um, and I, I'm quite astonished by some of the stories that have come to me. Uh, so one um, person told me that their um, uh, unit was moving into a new building and they were told that there would only be jobs in the new building for people who had security clearances. I found this quite surprising. <laughs> Um, and it seemed to me a, an unusual way to, to determine who is best suited to do a particular job. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who may have security clearances or those who may not know about it, it can require all sorts of information including your Facebook, Twitter accounts, sexual preferences, addictions, alcohol, and at least in the US if you admit any of it, even by accident, it's potentially a felony. Um, some examples of the data sets would be on citizenry. The central movement's alert list holds intelligence data about persons of concern to Australia. So that's, let's see, 22.6 million client records right there. That's as of 2014. Um, <clears throat> biometrics acquisition matching system collects, stores, and match biometrics and biographical data. Um, so that would be 3.8 million facial images, 200,000 fingerprints, uh, combined with the security creep. So my best estimation back of the envelope, security assessments and clearances in total over the past few years could exceed half a million. Now that'll include some uh, visa assessments as well, uh, but it's still quite a lot of, um, uh, of clearances and, and assessments. Meanwhile, <clears throat> let's get a point of reference here. Um, FOI requests that were finalized last year by the Commonwealth Government, 27,000, of them. And the most active agency was Department of Immigration Border Protection with 11,000 of them. And the second was Department of Human Services um, at 4,436. Um, another point of comparison is the warrantless metadata authorizations across Australia over the past four, four years, which would be probably in excess of about a million authorizations. Um, and the warrantless demands by government of personal details exceed FOI requests of government by a factor of more than 10, just as a metric to compare them. And the ratio of FOI requests per client record is equal to or probably less than um, one in 10,000. In fact, we don't know, I don't know, and perhaps if someone does know, please come up afterwards and tell me exactly how many um, uh, records are kept by all of government in Australia um, on its citizenry. But my guess is um, that figure is, uh, of the ratio request is actually probably um, much smaller. That's a fairly conservative estimate. So that just, you know, as a metric, it gives you an interesting perspective of the asymmetry of how much information is gathered and kept and how much is actually requested. So one of the questions that I think about is, uh, what happens, just get back to this for a second, what happens when things go wrong in an automated system? So what happens when your pattern matching, um, uh, your semi-automated or automated pattern matching, pattern matching doesn't turn up what it's supposed to? Um, there was a few years ago, you may recall, a, a, the case of um, the, the 
slapping what was it called the pregnant Chad in the Florida election in the U.S. some years ago. So after that, um, Jeb Bush had ordered the removal from the electoral rolls uh, a set of um, uh, people who were on the electoral rolls of Florida. And in fact, there were two sets that were taken out. But one of the key components of this was that um, 57,000 plus people in Florida were taken off the electoral rolls. Um, supposedly because they were felons and they weren't allowed to actually vote. But it turns out that if your name is John Williams, uh, you might have actually not been a felon at all, but your name was actually removed from the list. In fact, a number of John Williams might have been removed from the list. So there were in many instances of people who were actually denied the right to vote because of these auto pattern matching systems. The right to vote being, of course, one of the most fundamental rights that we have in a democracy, a really core right. Why is this important? Because this particular case, which is sort of well known, um, illustrates what can go wrong with a pattern matching and how there's no individual justice you know, for an individual who has to fight a particular case. So why is it so important to have FOI? Why is it so important to have strong, and I would actually argue potentially expanded FOI? Because as you have more big data and as you have more automated functionality analyzing it, you are likely to have a larger number of people who suffer injustices at an individual level through the errors in these systems. And they must have avenues to rectify those injustices. And FOI is one of the best ways to actually do that. So it's very, very important that these remain intact. I think about another case of FOI, which is not so much the case of an individual who suffered injustice, although there certainly was that element to it, but rather of the public interest. Uh, and that is the case of the Apache helicopter video, known as Collateral Murder, that WikiLeaks published some, uh, in 2010. But the important element of that story for this discussion is not so much the WikiLeaks end of it. It's that that particular video was FOI'd by Reuters to find out what had happened to its photographer, to its employees on the ground in Baghdad. So the initial reports that were reported in the New York Times, information provided then by the government, was no mention of children. There was firefight from the ground. Um, the, the pilots were just responding with, with fight in return. Uh, there were weapons. All of these things turned out to be a lie. Um, and, and, and worse, not only were they a lie, but a Reuters was denied FOI access to this critical video that showed they were a lie and showed what actually happened to their employees, which is that they were gunned down in cold blood, not holding any weapons and there was no firefight, and that the Good Samaritan who drove up a short time afterwards trying to bring one of them up off the pavement into his van to take him to hospital was also gunned down and that his children, who happened to be sitting in the van because he'd stopped on his way, uh, were gunned as well. Now, they weren't killed, but they were seriously injured. And that this video was used as a basis for criminal charges against Chelsea Manning because it was release of a classified document. But we find out subsequently from the court proceedings that it was never classified. And so here we have a gross, a diabolical failure of the FOI system, and a diabolical failure that has huge ramifications for the public interest. That is, potentially, serious war crimes and lies that were told to cover up, including lies to a court and charges of a criminal nature that were laid against someone on the basis of lies told to a court. So it's very important that FOI not only exist, but that it be strong and robust and protected and respected. Because there are cases such as this in the public interest that must go forward and the people must know that these things happen. Um, let me go on to another point a bit more optimistically, which is a question of whether or not FOI could contribute to a renewed trust in the institution of government in the longer term. So I, I probably don't have to tell you all, but trust in government in Australia has um, dropped substantially and been going one direction, which is downhill. So in the last year, according to Edelman, 
uh, research, it's gone from 56% to 49% in the eyes of the informed public as they classify that category of people they're surveying. And that drop in our region was only surpassed by Malaysia and South Korea. It's not a good outcome. Um, and in fact, business had an even greater drop, 11 points. I think that's interesting because it's important, obviously, for economic resilience, how much people trust business. Um, trust requires, according to the respondents, communicating openly, transparently, and frequently. All elements of a really good and well-functioning FOI system. I would say that castrating an FOI system, cutting out pieces of it, isn't going to help that, but rather, doing it properly, ensuring that it works, removing economic barriers to accessing it, removing time barriers to access it, actually can go some way to rebuilding that trust. If you think about it, in part, that's why FOI was brought in all those years ago, was to keep that trust with the citizenry. And so it's been nibbled at at the edges and pulled and yanked in here and there. And I don't say that it hasn't had some growing pains. Clearly it has. And there are some issues that do need to be looked at, such as frank and full advice. However, I think it's critical to understand that to, to take it apart in any substantive way, to carve out large swaths of data that would otherwise naturally fall in it, would be to undermine these really important principles that it was put there in the first place to achieve. The one thing I would say to this is that um, it requires ethical behavior from politicians, from bureaucrats um, alike. A and obviously that's something that I'm sure is you know, in large quantity in this room. People are afraid, I guess, in some instances, to give frank and fearless advice. But at the end of the day, if it's frank and fearless advice that is actually aligned, that people can see, is aligned with their own best interests, because that's really what the fundamental nature of trust is about, I think that is much less of a concern than, you know, than if it's not. So th that's, that's really all I wanted to say today about FOI. I'm generally a free speech sort of advocate, as you can probably tell on these things. Um, but I see the, the threat of the world tomorrow is a threat where the individual citizen doesn't have access to redress of injustices that are caused by an increasingly automated system of big data. And, and in additionally, um, you know, the risk that our media doesn't have the freedom to access information about how decisions are made um, is a very real one. And that in any way to reduce the scope of FOI is actually to you know, reduce one of those pillars that protects our free and open democratic society. So that's all, thanks.